Well, all right, we're going to be in the book of Joshua today. We have finished the Pentateuch. And so uh, the five books of Moses uh, we ended last week. And so I, I'm really excited. It only took us a half a year to do that. And so um, that's pretty good for the Pentateuch. The rest of the books we won't spend as much time on. Uh, those are foundational, and they're also some of the most controversial uh, as far as both teachings and writing, who wrote it and that. But not to be outdone, this book is also controversial over uh, who the author is or the editors were. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I gave you some uh, uh, the, the very first section on the handout uh, just talks about that a little bit. Um, I'm not going to uh, be able to satisfy any scholar, probably not even satisfy you on my discussion of who wrote it, but uh, I'm going to attempt to do it in just a second. So uh, Joshua, let me start reading. I want to read uh, the first nine verses of the book of Joshua, and we'll use it as the background for the introduction of the book and then walk through the book uh, together. So, now it came to pass, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so that's the introduction. By the way, just to let you know the timeline, I told you that I believed that Moses wrote uh, the five books of Moses. <laughs> I told you that Mo I, I believe that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that he wrote them in the wilderness wandering. Part of the reason why I believe that is right here when God speaks to Joshua he says, don't let the word of this law depart from you. And so that means he had to have the book of the law, which is what it says, which means it had to be written in Joshua's day. Now, there are people, there are critics, um, scholars, who would, uh, 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 my, uh, my predecessor at Kirby Woods Baptist in Memphis used to call those kinds of scholars Professor Smelly Fungus, and uh, that's what he would call them. But uh, there are scholars who would dispute that any of this is true, um, that, that Joshua didn't receive this word from the Lord. There's no supernatural power. If there's no supernatural power, there's no word from God that comes written by Moses and, and all of that. So when you start undermining God's word, just be careful that you undermine it all. If you, can't, if you can't believe that God really said to Moses, I mean to Joshua to read the book I gave to Moses, if he didn't say that, then he may not have made the sun stand still. He didn't cause hailstones to fall from the sky. Uh, there's no such people as Israel. None of this is true. You know, once you start whittling away at what's true and not true, it's only up to the reader to decide that. And um, the Bible says that the uh, the heart of man is, is exceedingly wicked, exceedingly desperate. Uh, and so, um, anyway, I, so, so I just want you to understand, once more time as I run through this, I believe the Bible. 
I may not can explain it all, but I believe the Bible. I believe God spoke it. It was recorded by different authors over different periods of time. And let me just say this. If Samuel wrote the book of Joshua, which is possible, it still doesn't mean God didn't God didn't speak it. Now, I believe Joshua actually wrote it, but there are some who'd say, well, it, it was probably compiled later by Samuel. You know, Samuel wrote the book of Ruth. Samuel wrote those kinds of things. So it's possible that Samuel came back. Either way, whoever, whether it was Joshua or Samuel, I believe it's God's word. Does that make sense? And I believe that Joshua wrote it, by the way, but I'm just, I'm just letting you know, there are, there are some very good, Bible-believing, following Jesus, heaven-seeing people who believe that Samuel wrote it, and they can be wrong if they want to. So, I'm just teasing. I, uh, I, you know, um, <laughs> I said that to somebody one time, I, well, you, you know, you can be wrong if you want to, and they said, or I could agree with you and we'd both be wrong. <laughs> so, I just thought, <laughs> okay, well, that's good. That's a good repartee, so... Um, let me give you the introduction to the book of Joshua. Um, the, well, I've just entitled it Fulfilling His Promise to Abram, Abraham. Uh, the picture is from uh, an artist's rendition of the Levites in the middle of the Jordan. So if you remember, where we left off at the end of Deuteronomy is on the other side of the Jordan, the Transjordan. They're now on the, they were on the east side of the Jordan, when the Lord says to Joshua in chapter 1, get up and cross over the Jordan, he's saying go from the east to the west. What happened was they, they really went all the way around the, the Holy Land, and now they're on the east side of it waiting to come back in. Um, here is my New Testament quote for you to just consider. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Uh, the second passage that I've given you on the handout is about Rahab. She's one of my favorite characters uh, in the Bible. There's so much promise in Rahab's character that it's important to, uh, to understand all of it. I don't have time really to go deeply into who she is. Uh, I know some people like to say, well, it doesn't really mean harlot. It means innkeeper. Um, <laughs> Well, you can call it whatever you want, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I mean, obviously they had other words than harlot in, in, for, that they could have used, and that's what that second passage is about, and so um, just an in, interesting and encouraging um, uh, person, character in Scripture. So the, oh, that's not Deuteronomy, I failed you, that should say the introduction to Joshua, Joshua, so Scratch that out and put Joshua. The title is Joshua. It's, uh, it's about the character. It doesn't, um, nowhere does it say specifically that Joshua wrote it, but there are things all throughout that, that indicate that he probably did. The first person is used uh, often, which means that whoever wrote it is uh, is identifying with the main character in the book. And so, uh, the, whether it's named after the character or the author, uh, the, the title is Joshua, and, man, I messed this thing up. I just left Deuteronomy. I'm so sorry. Yeah, y'all, y'all do not know. Y'all now know that I am not perfect. <laughs> if, if you, if you thought that, if I had you, if I had you fooled yet, uh, does anybody know what the word Joshua means? Yeah, yes, it means, uh, it means the Lord saves. Yahshua, uh, Yeshua, I mean not Yeshua. It means the Lord Yah. Whenever you hear Yah in the book, Elijah, Elisha, Joshua. Um, the, the idea is that Yahweh is in, in that. Uh, if you ever hear the word El, uh, E-L, that's, that's the word for God. And so uh, Old Testament names mean something. If you, ever, if you ever hear the word Baal or Baal, that's bad too. You know, we said, but they're all in people's names. Uh, Joshua means the Lord saved, Yahweh saves. This is also Jesus' name. I know that... Uh, 
we grew up knowing Je- Jesus, the, the word Jesus, the name Jesus, is the Greek rendering of it. Um, the, the Hebrew Aramaic rendering of Jesus' name is Joshua, the Lord saves. Um, Yeshua is, the, is the, the rendition of this. How many of you, that's the first time you've ever heard that? Uh, all right, so uh, let me just, since I'm blowing your mind with all kinds of new stuff, let me just tell you one, one other thing. The word Messiah and the word Christ mean the same thing. Messiah is Hebrew for the anointed one, and uh, the word Christ is Greek for the exact same, exact same concept. So um, Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach um, is both Jesus the anointed one or Jesus the promised one. And so um, that's the uh, same, same name. Uh, in fact, in some ways, um, uh, <laughs> Joshua is a type of Jesus. I just heard, I just, so how many of you like bad jokes? Anybody like bad jokes? Can I tell one? Sure. Okay, I, I will. Um, so, um, so Joshua and Moses, well, that's not how it goes. Let me say this. Uh, so Moses and Melchizedek and Jesus walk into a bar. Have y'all, anybody heard this yet? Okay. So, so Melchizedek and Moses and Jesus walk into a bar and, uh, and the bartender says, we don't serve your type here. And so Melchizedek and Moses leave. So let me tell you about uh, what types mean. <laughs> In the Bible, when we talk about a type, uh, there's a type and an anti-type. Uh, this is also in literature, but it's specifically in the Bible. A type is someone who typifies the person of Christ. So uh, Joseph typifies the person of Christ. In certain ways, he acts like Christ was going to act. Joshua, in certain ways, he acted like Christ was going to act. Moses, in certain ways. Melchizedek, probably the greatest, uh, the, most, um, the most talked about in the New Testament um, and in Psalms type of Christ. And so uh, that's a bad joke about, we don't serve your types here. So Sorry. That may be worse than putting Deuteronomy up here still. So uh, the title is Joshua. The theme of the book of Joshua is Yahweh, fulf- Yahweh God fulfills his promise to Abraham. Now, why is that? He's a leader. That's right. So if you read verse 6 again, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. That's Abraham. Abraham, he says, get up, leave your father's house, and go to the place that I'm going to show you. This is it. And so this is the initial or the, the, the first um, fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. Obviously, ultimately, it'll be when Jesus returns and the whole earth is given to the children of Abraham that this is finally and fully um, fulfilled. But in this case, it, it, he fulfills. So they're, they're possessing the land. They're going into the land, which fulfills the promise that God made to Abraham uh, long, long years ago. So the author and date, I believe it's Joshua, about 1405 B.C. Uh, that's That's... What I believe, there are others who would say it was written around the 1200s with Samuel. There are still others who think it was written over time and maybe not until much, much later. But those people don't usually believe the Bible in what it says. They would dispute the miracles, the supernatural existences in, uh, in the book of Joshua, and I don't. I hold, I hold fully. I believe boulders fell from heaven that were great hailstones. I believe the sun stood still. Um, I believe the walls of Jericho fell after they walked around them seven times. I believe all of that. And so um, I believe that Joshua wrote it in four, about 14. I mean, he didn't date it, so I don't know if exactly like that, but it's close to that. Here are the theological contributions of the book of Joshua. Um, it's the initial fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. 
Uh, by the way, there's one other side. This is the land portion to walk into the, the physical portion of this promise he made to Abraham. But in the person of Rahab, who I've already introduced slightly, in the person of Rahab, it's also God's promise, fulfillment of God's promise to the Gentiles that in Abraham all the nations would be blessed. And so uh, this is why Rahab is a seminal figure in the Bible. She is absolutely important. There is no righteousness in her. She doesn't come from the right lineage. She's not even a guy. None of those things that people look back into the Old Testament and think you have to be in order for God to bless you, and yet God blesses her and all her progeny, and eventually Rahab is in the lineage of Jesus. That's right. This is, hers is an incredible story. And so uh, I don't know if I'll have time to get to it today, but we'll see if I can. So the initial fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Number two, supernatural activities on behalf of his people. I think, if I remember correctly, I, I'm, a, I'm in a daze and I've put Deuteronomy on all kinds of stuff and I've made like six misspellings in that thing I gave you. Um, but I think the third one on there is the discussion about um, God's supernatural power from Joshua chapter 10. Um, and discussing how God acted and what you actually see are all the verbs about what Israel did um, all the verbs are in the singular pointing towards Jesus I mean pointing towards Yahweh God doing them so this is God fighting for his people uh, which is not new we saw it in Exodus stand still and watch as the Lord delivers you we see it again here uh, the Lord delivering his people. So supernatural activities on behalf of his people. And then the final, at the very end, a warning and prophecy about the temptations of the foreign gods that are around them. So idolatry is still, is still um, uh, in the forefront of the message from the Lord, stay away from foreign gods, for, from foreign idols. Um, Here's a picture, we'll talk about it in a second, but here's a picture somewhat of the divided um, Holy Land. We'll get to it in a minute if I get a chance. Uh, here's the outline to the book of Joshua. First, we have the conquest of Canaan. So we have them crossing over the Jordan River, heading into Canaan, the Holy Land, and moving all the way through it fighting battles, possessing the south and then the north, and moving all around, uh, and, and it's, we call it the conquest of Canaan. The second section, chapters 13 to 22, is the division of Canaan. That is how Canaan, or, or the Holy Land, was divided up among all of the tribes of Israel. And so how they were doing that. Which tribe did not get any land? That's right, the tribe of the Levites. I'll tell you shortly, because in the book of Joshua we see it, I'll tell you shortly what they did get instead of, um, instead of land. So um, just for those of you who can't read it, uh, I'll just go around from uh, about the 5 o'clock position on a clock and go counterclockwise around, back around. We have Reuben, uh, on the other side of the Dead Sea, still on the far side of the Jordan, Gad just north of them, Manasseh, uh, half-tribe of Manasseh up to the north of Gad, and then across the Jordan there, past the Sea of Galilee, Naphtali and Asher over on the Mediterranean. Down from that, the little purple one that you can't see is Zebulun, right there in the, uh, in the middle. Just to the right of it is Issachar, and then below that is the other half-tribe of Manasseh, that goldenrod color in the middle. Below it is Ephraim. And you see in Ephraim, there's a place called Shiloh. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was all the way up until the days of Samuel. Uh, so that's Ephraim. Right below Ephraim is Benjamin. Off to the west from there is Dan. Below Dan uh, and uh, Benjamin is Judah. That's the, the darker brownish color just to the west of the Dead Sea. And then uh, where Beersheba is, you have, um, you have Simeon. 
Um, and so, by the way, don't get this confused. We have the tribal land of Dan over on the, on the Mediterranean next to Ephraim. But up in the very northern part, uh, just on the other side of the Jordan River, really at the headwaters of the Jordan, is the city of Dan. It's not the tribal uh, land of Dan. And so when you hear in the, in the Bible, it says they went from Dan to Beersheba. Does that sound familiar? They were from Dan to Beersheba. They're really talking about the whole expanse of the Holy Land. Dan is in the north. Beersheba is in the south. They went from Dan to Beersheba. It's a way of talking about the expanse north to south of the Holy Land. Does that make sense? All right, so that's really in chapters 13 to 22, the division of Canaan. Chapters 23 and 24, there are only 24 chapters in the book of Joshua. Uh, we have Joshua's farewell address. Who can quote me? Address. That's exactly right. Choose you this day whom you may serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's right, absolutely. Probably, maybe the most oft quoted, except, except for Joshua 1 9, be strong and very courageous. Those two uh, really are bookends to the, to the book, and, uh, and that's what most people know. So, Joshua's farewell address at the end, and then the death of Joshua at the very end. <laughs> it usually is. So, um, the death of Joshua at the end of the book. Any questions so far about the outline? I'm going to walk through it now um, and, and highlight just portions of this. My goal is to uh, not preach through the whole book, but rather now just highlight some things. This is a survey, so I, my goal is to finish it today. If you have any questions, though, or if there's a favorite part of Joshua that, uh, that I didn't talk about, and you want to talk about it, I will. Um, I love the book of Joshua. I have preached through it before. Um, so obviously I could, we could spend a year in the book of Joshua and it would make me no, never mind. But uh, uh, we don't have a year for that. So uh, if I miss something or jump over something that you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll, we'll discuss it. So let's talk about the conquest of the land. Uh, it starts here in chapter 1. It's really the first 12 chapters. Um, I've outlined the major movements, and I'll talk about them, but if any of this spurs you on, just tell me something, and we'll talk about it. So first, Joshua is commissioned. Before we go any further, you may think that Joshua was a scaredy cat. Why would you think that Joshua was a scaredy cat? Because three times God has to tell him to be courageous. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the purpose. That's the thing. It's not that he's a scaredy cat. He's a very brave person. He has huge shoes to fill. From the day that Moses walked back into Egypt, it was only Moses that God used. Now, he used, he used Aaron and he used Miriam, but we saw when they tried to you know, rise up what happened to them, there was nobody else like Moses. God spoke to Moses differently than he spoke to anybody else and even though that God spoke to Moses in different ways the people still didn't do what Moses told them to do so now you are the successor who doesn't have the same privileges the same calling the same giftedness that God gave Moses and now God says all right get up and lead all this people into the Holy Land. And you're going to fight the whole way through. So this is a big deal. This is not your normal calling. Um, so that's why God says so clearly, be strong and very courageous. These three times in this first uh, chapter is not the only time that he does it. If you remember when he commissioned him in Deuteronomy, he said it again, be strong and very courageous. Uh, that may be a repeat, it may be a repetitive, God may have only ever said it three times, but uh, we have it recorded in Deuteronomy and then again recorded here. So he says, be very, in fact, I've got a sermon that I preach often. This is, this, 
Um, sometimes preachers have a sermon and they call it their sugar stick. You ever heard that phrase? Okay, it's called your sugar stick. It means if you get caught in a pinch, you have something quick to pull out and to nibble on. So it's, it's your sugar stick. It's the one that you go to all the time. I don't really, because of the way I preach, I don't really have a sugar stick sermon. Although if I did, this would be one of them. If I had one, I've preached this one probably six or eight times, ten times maybe, and um, it may be what I preach in Branson in, uh, in a few, uh, in next month when I go over there. But uh, the, the, just real quick, three, three points from what God tells them to do. He tells them to stand up. He tells them to stand up. Stand up. In fact, it, quoted straight out of there. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise. Get up. Stop sitting around worrying about Moses. Remember, they mourned for him for a month. They mourned for Moses. Now God's saying, get up. It's time to move. So stand up. Then he tells them to cross the Jordan. Step out. Stand up. Step out. So you cross... You can't just stand. Don't just stand there. Follow me. Step out. Go where I tell you to go. And he tells them to stay straight. Don't depart to the left or to the right from what I've told you to do. Stay straight. Go exactly where I tell you to do. The point of that sermon is what happens when God calls you? What happens when God calls you? You stand up, you step out, and you stay straight. And so I've preached it a dozen times. I won't preach it today. Um, maybe not a dozen times, maybe a half dozen. I preached it a bunch, more than I can count. Have I preached it here yet? Is that one that I preached outside? I preached that outdoors. Oh, no. When is it? 12, 27, 20. See, I've I've preached that thing so many times I've forgotten. Uh, it's It's a wonderful, well, not that I did it, like, oh, it's a great sermon. You ought to hear it. I don't mean that. I mean, it is a wonderful passage of Scripture to apply to our lives as we, uh, as we walk with the Lord. So Joshua is commissioned in chapter 1. Uh, then he, sent, he sends spies into Jericho. Now, why would he send spies into Jericho? Does anybody know where Jericho is? It is right across the Jordan River. Um, it's just to the north and east west of the Dead Sea. Uh, If you go with me to Israel, uh, we will go and see um, Jericho. We'll we'll see it. Jericho is an oasis there. Uh, It's in the middle of a desert, but it's a, you can see um, there's water, all the stuff you need. And so it was a heavily fortified city. And so Joshua sent spies into uh, Jericho, just to, to find out uh, the weaknesses of it, to sit, figure out how they were going to, uh, to take it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can write it down, and you can go search it out later. Joshua's, Joshua's plan may have been to find the weakness in Jericho. God's plan was to rescue Rahab. Because God didn't even use the spies' information to tear down Jericho. It was not a military conquest. It was a supernatural event. So then why would God send his representatives into the city if he wasn't going to use the information to rescue Rahab? That's a big deal. I mean, this is, this is how much God loves people. He was going to destroy Jericho, but he was going to save Rahab and her family. And if you, re- if you read the words that I put in that, in that thing, she, she was not just a harlot, but she was a harlot in a heathen land, and God rescued her. So that's, I mean, I, you just talk about God's grace. That's God's grace right there. And so the whole reason these spies go in is to stay in a house of ill repute or an inn, <laughs> if you will. but uh, to stay. And by the way, they weren't doing anything untoward, but if you're going to be foreigners in a, in a walled city, the best place to go is where all the other foreigners are going, 
It was just a place for them to hide. So nothing untoward. Don't think that because these these men were representing Yahweh. They were righteously there. And so uh, anyway, all that, just an incredible thought. Spies sent into Jericho. Then they crossed the Jordan. I know I've preached this. Uh, I preached it last Memorial Day uh, on um, uh, on the memorial stones of chapter four. Uh, they God opens up so the the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant walk into the Jordan River, which is swollen by the way at this time. It's flooded. It's it's really big. When we go up to Dan, if you go to uh, Israel with me, when you go up to Dan, you'll see the waters rushing in those headwaters, uh, and then periodically throughout our trip we'll be bouncing off the Jordan River Um, you want to get baptized there um, or um, immersed there if you've already been baptized uh, you want to be immersed there I'm going to be doing that Uh, it'll be a a lot of fun the water is chilly so just recognize that but it's fun and so uh, they crossed the Jordan Levites walked into the middle of, of the Jordan River with the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their feet hit it, God piled up the waters so that they could cross over. The whole uh, of the Israelite people crossed over behind them. Uh, In the middle, they selected one of the elders, one of the representatives from all of the different tribes to pick up a stone out of it. Now, I don't think it was a stone, one that you could throw. I think it was a stone. You know, so they, they picked it up because they piled them up on the far side of the Jordan so that when their kids said, what's that pile of rocks doing there? They could say, that's when God delivered us, brought us into the promised land, and o- opened up the waters. Uh, it was a, it, they were rocks of remembrance there on the far, on the far side. Um, so the crossing of the Jordan, and then the fall of Jericho, you have heard this, you have sung this, you have watched it on Josh and the Big Wall. If you have grandkids that have, or, or kids that have seen Veggie Tales, um, this is the, uh, the, maybe the greatest military um, exploit in, uh, in all of history. Uh, they, they walked around once a day for six days, uh, they, they marched around the wall. The seventh day, they marched around it seven times, blew those trumpets at the end, and the walls came tumbling down. That's right. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, <laughs> and the walls came tumbling down. And so um, everybody in it was destroyed, killed, except Rahab and her family. How did they know where she was? There was a ribbon out of her window, they rescued her, they killed everybody else, and that's the fall of Jericho. Does anybody know the curse that was, that was uh, pronounced over Jericho? That's right, it was never supposed to be rebuilt. Um, and the ones who, uh, every stone, the Bible says, was laid off of, there was no, and whoever put stones back on top of each other to rebuild it would be, uh, would be cursed. And so, let me read you some. I I skipped past, I was so busy trying to tell this story, that up in uh, the spies sent to Jericho in chapter 2, let me read you, I just want you to hear the confession of faith that that Rahab made. So starting in verse 8, now before they lay down, these are the spies. She came up to them on the roof. So you remember the spies were on the roof, laid down. She covered them over with a, a, a mat so that nobody could see them. Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord, that is Yahweh, all right, the all caps Lord, I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord, how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man no longer because of you. For Yahweh your God, he is God 
in heaven above and on earth beneath. What you just heard was a confession of faith by a pagan prostitute. That's what you just heard. I know that the Lord is giving you this land. That is a statement of faith. God had not yet done it. She believed, and just like it was said about Abraham, she believed, and it was accounted to her, it was reckoned to her as righteousness. That is grace through faith in, in her. What you're reading is her confession of faith. Uh, that's why I had to go back and read that. She and her family were the only ones rescued from Jericho. Um, what were they supposed to do? Destroy. Utterly destroy everything. Who is Achan and why do we know him? <laughs> he stole some stuff. That's right. He took um, he took some goods, some silver, and hid them in his tent. After that, the children of Israel were to go up against Ai, another city, the next city in the conquest. They were to go up against Ai and utterly destroy Ai. Now, God had already promised them that everything was going to go okay. Every place where they put their feet, they would have success. It would be theirs. But when they got to Ai, what happened? They were not successful. They were defeated. And so that caused them to wonder what has happened. And what they found was the, were the goods that were supposed to be destroyed. By the way, this word, uh, the word that we have is korban. Korban. Remember I introduced you to that, well, maybe not for the first time, but I reminded you of that a few weeks ago, that it was holy to be given to the Lord. So we say everything was to be destroyed, and in a, in a sense it was, but that was because it all belonged to God. So it was all like a burnt offering to the Lord. It was all to be given to God. Nobody was supposed to touch it. Achan did. And because he did, it brought defeat on the children of Israel. They, they met defeat. So they went out, they searched him out, they found him, and they, set, they, they rebuked him sternly. Is that what they did? No, they killed him. Yeah, they stoned him. He, he forfeited his life over treasure. What does it gain a person, or what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? You see this picture, and that's the picture with Achan. As soon as they had dealt with the sin in the camp, they defeated Ai. They went up and did it all again, and they defeated them the next time. All of this is according to God's plan. God was leading them as they were going through this conquest in Canaan. So, um, I skipped over... <laughs> I'm just doing this terribly bad today. Um, and the only reason why I say that is um, an interesting thought... Before they went into Jericho, they stopped in a place called Gilgal. And at Gilgal, they made preparations to go in. Who knows what the chief preparation was before they went into Jericho? Yes. To a bunch of adults. So, <laughs> I'm not going to go any further. And I, I was preaching, let's see, what book was I preaching through? I was preaching through a book of the Bible at Kirby Woods, and it just so happened that the day I got to circumcision, <laughs> this is funny, um, the day that I got to circumcision, I can't remember what book of the Bible it was, I can't remember if it was a New Testament book talking about circumcision, um, or it was an Old Testament book talking, I can't, oh, it may have been Exodus, but on that morning that I preached on circumcision, we had the most people join the church. 
of, of the whole, I mean, like we had 20 people come forward at the invitation. And I remember that because some of the jokesters in my congregation said, he ought to preach on circumcision more often. You know? <laughs> so, um, so that's how they prepared in their obedience to go in. Remember, this is almost identical to what happened with Moses when he was going back into Egypt to free the people. Um, he was, God confronted him and his son was circumcised. Here, they, they make a ceremony of it and they, they prepare themselves for the Holy Land. They, they, have their, uh, they go to circumcision. One other event happened uh, also there, which is an incredible, incredible thought before they went in to uh, Jericho. And that is... Uh, Joshua was out on a reconnaissance, reconnoitering, probably walking the lines, walking around the camp, uh, preparing to go into Jericho. And who did he come across? Does anybody remember? Yeah, the, the commander of the Lord's army. So he sees this fellow with a sword drawn. Now that's a, just as a soldier, I mean, that'd be the equivalent of you walking, the, walking your perimeter and you come across another person with a weapon drawn. So their version of halt who goes there was, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the person said, no. <laughs> no, neither. But as the commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. There's lots of things to take from this. I do believe that this is a Christophany, uh, a, a, an appearance of the Lord Jesus before he was incarnate. Uh, I believe that's who he is. Um, so that's the first thing you need to see. The reason why I believe that is because immediately Joshua falls on his face and then is commanded to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. Again, this whole this whole motif of he has just come in the presence of God himself. Angels, by the way, never commanded worship. In fact, all throughout the Bible, when an, an ordinary angel, if there's such a thing, uh, an ordinary angel comes to somebody and they do that, they're like, oh, no, 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 don't be afraid. Stand up, it's okay, everything's okay. But when they come in, in contact with the angel of the Lord, it's not like that. They immediately worship. And so I believe that this was Jesus the second thing that I want you to see from this is that God is not on our side. We must be on His side. God is doing work. God has a plan. And He is inviting us to participate with Him, not Him come and assist us. And so... Are you for us or are your, our enemies? Neither, but as the angel of the armies of the Lord, I've now come. Uh, he is on his own side, and he calls us to be with him, to walk with him in that way. And so um, that's the fall of Jericho. That's leading up to the fall of Jericho. The sin of Achan, and then uh, the battle at Gibeon in chapter 10. This kind of concludes the, um, the southern... Uh, um, conquest, Gibeon, the Gibeonites trick Israel. Does anybody know how they tricked them or why they tricked them? That's right. They, they made it seem like they were, they were helpless or weak and they came to them in need. And so the Israelites promised to help them and then they revealed who they were, but because of their promises to stay with them and help them, they were now bound to them. So when the Gibeonites were attacked, Israel, because of their promises, had to stand up and be people of their word. And so they went to fight for the Gibeonites. And it's this, the five kings attacked Gibeon in chapter 10. Um, now it came about when Adonai Zedek king of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly a, a destroyed. Uh, by the way, um, no kids in deck. Um, Zedek, righteousness. Um, Adonai Zedek, Lord of righteousness, is Adonai Zedek, 
king of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had captured Ai, he had utterly destroyed it, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land that he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai. So he gets uh, four other kings to go and attack. So Gibeon says to Joshua, verse 6, don't abandon your servants, come up to us quickly and help save us. So Joshua spoke to the Lord, verse, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal and nine, and the Lord confounded them before Israel. By the way, that is God's modus operandi. You look throughout all of the Bible, the way that he destroys a people is to confound them, confuse them. He did it in the Red Sea with the Egyptians. He does it here. Uh, he does it later with the Assyrians. He, he just, he, he confuses their enemies and they, uh, he does it with Gideon uh, and the Midianites. I mean, just all throughout. This is the way the Lord uh, fights battles. So, um, so he confounded them and, uh, and he, that is the Lord, slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Makedah. As they fled from before Israel while they were at the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. That's pretty impressive. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and the moon in the valley. The sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. So everything stopped so that they could do what God had called them to do. Um, go back just a little bit. Every time that the presence of the Lord picked up and moved, what were the children of Israel to do? They were to follow. Sometimes they marched all night. Sometimes they marched for days. I believe God was preparing them for this battle right here. So when the sun stood still and the moon stopped, they kept fighting and kept fighting, and kept fighting. They were conditioned by the boot camp in the wilderness. They were, they were ready to do what God had told them to do. They were conditioned for this battle, and the battles, the, all really the whole conquest of, of the, uh, uh, the Holy Land. And so, pretty impressive. God confounded them. Uh, he struck them uh, notice all this. This is the Lord doing all this. He struck them, even though it was with the sword of the army of the Israelites. God did it. He used his people to do it. He chased them. He threw large stones on them. So more were killed by the large stones or the hailstones than were by the sword of the Israelites. And, uh, and then Joshua asked the Lord, to let the day go on so they could continue their pursuit until they were finished with the battle. Uh, that's a pretty impressive chapter of Scripture right there, uh, that God fought the battle for His people. You may ask this question, I've already answered it, but you may ask this question, do you believe this happened? The answer is absolutely. Every single word of it, I believe. You say, well, the earth would have fallen off its axis if the sun stood still. Not if God, God's the one that put it on its axis. God's the one that, like a Harlem Globetrotter, put that thing up there and went, and spun it on its axis in the first place. He can stop it and spin it again. God's in charge. He made the rules. We're like, well, the, the laws of physics. Who do you think wrote those laws? Isaac Asimov, you know, I mean, or Sir Isaac Newton, or, you know, no, God did. Isaac Asimov was way out there. I didn't mean to say that. I meant Isaac Newton. Um, Isaac Asimov's the one who wrote fiction. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the, the whole thing, God did this. God can certainly um, suspend all of the laws of creation that he put in place to do. I mean, he, he brought Jesus back from the dead. Right? You, you see what I mean? That's, and that's the foundation of our belief. If God can take a dead man and make him alive, he can stop the earth for 12 or 14 or 16 hours so that Joshua can continue 
to, uh, to fight the battle. So that's what happened in the, uh, the Battle of Gibeon. And this, this wraps up um, uh, the, southern, uh, the southern swing and then the northern frontier taken in chapter 11. Chapter 12 finishes. They have now completely um, taken the promised land. Does anybody remember why they had to, they had to take it sequentially? Why they had to take it town by town, city by city. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, so the wild beasts wouldn't take over. God said, I'm going to make you take it sequentially. So that, because if I just wiped out all the people all at once and you didn't move in, then the animals would come in and you'd have to fight them. What happened to all the cities and all the houses and all the farms of the Holy Land after Israel marched through? They were divided up. In fact, literally, they lived in houses that they didn't build, they harvested from vineyards they didn't plant, and they lived in cities that they didn't fortify. God gave them, in our vernacular, lock, stock, and barrel, everything in the promised land. He said, here you go, it's yours. And they just moved in and they took it over. This is the this is the story of their um, conquest of the promised land. And then they divided up the land. I'm not going to go in, in detail on this, except that we have the introduction of the division of the land in chapter 13. I will read that. It gives a fairly good uh, precursor to it. Seven verses of chapter 13. Now Joshua was old, and advanced in years when the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. <laughs> um, so uh, last night uh, I made a joke about people being older in the, uh, in the congregation that was here. Uh, it's one thing if your whippersnapper of a pastor says it, it's something completely different if God says you're old and advanced in years. So I'm, I'm just saying that uh, um, Joshua was old and advanced in years when the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years, and very much of the land remains to be possessed. This is the land that remains. All the region of the Philistines and those of the Geshurites, from the Sheor, which is east of Egypt, even as far as the border of Ekron to the north, it is counted as Canaanite. The five lords of the Philistines, the Gazite, the Ash Ashdodite, the Ashkelonite, the Gittite, the Ekronite, and the Avite to the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Merah, the belongings of the Sidonians, as far as Aphek, to the border of the Amorite, and the land of the Gebelite, and all of Lebanon toward the east, from Baal Gad, there's that word, Baal Gad, Baal Gad, below Mount Hermon, as far as Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon, as far as Mishrephoth, Maim, all the Sidonians, I will drive them out from before the sons of Israel, only allot it to Israel for an inheritance as I commanded you. Now therefore apportion this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. Why nine and a half? Because there are two and a half still on the far side of Jordan. Now they're fighters, all of their mighty men went with them and fought all the way through, but their people stayed, their, their children and women stayed on the far side. And when they were finished, the conquest, the, the other two and a half tribes fighting men went back to the other side and inhabited the, the east side of the Jordan. So nine and a half tribes on the west side of Jordan. I've already apportioned it out to you. I've already shown you that, so I'm not going to do it again. Uh, you see the allotment of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh on the far side. Caleb gets his mountain. Now, who is Caleb? He's the faithful spy from Numbers chapter 24. From all the way back, 40 years before, when he was 45 years old, now it says that he is 85 and as strong today as he was then, uh, his coming in and going out. It's funny that uh, God told Joshua he was old and advanced in age, but that's not the picture that we have of Caleb. Caleb has uh, vigor and vitality, and uh, he asked for, in chapter 14, he asked for a mountain. Uh, we used to sing, did anybody know that song, I Want That Mountain? Anybody sing that long years ago? For, I want that mountain, 
I want that mountain where the uh, milk and honey flow. I don't know the rest of it. I was a kid when we sang it. But it was, it, this is Caleb's call. I want the mountain land and the springs that are on it. And he gets it because of his faithfulness. And it, it, it belonged to his family uh, from then on. So Caleb gets his mountain, chapters 14, verses 1 to 15. Uh, and then subsequent allotments for the other tribes. The Bible in chapters 15 to 19 just goes through and gives the boundaries for all of the tribes. Now, what happens if somebody from, the, uh, from one of the tribes it, comes into need and sells his land to somebody else? What happens to that land? It goes to the other tribe until when? The year of Jubilee, and it's all returned because God is the one that set the boundaries of all of the lands. This is His doing not just the people's doing. And so God incorporated into the year of Jubilee their, the way that they worked through their things so that, that the people would get their land back. The tribes possessed their own land. Uh, any questions about the division of the land? All right. Joshua's farewell address, chapters 23 and 24. Uh, you can turn over there if you will. I'm not going to read all of it but I will read a portion of it. It's the last two chapters of the book of Joshua. Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side, and Joshua was old, advanced in years, that Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years. Some smart mouth kid in the back said, tell us something we don't know. So he is old, advanced in, in years. He called them all together. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. And so it's in that vein that he recounts all that God has done for them. This is a reminder just of the blessings of the Lord. So he's saying, Yahweh God has been good to Israel. But then he says, you are now faced with other gods. You are faced with other gods, and you see that in chapters 14, in verses 14 and 15. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. Let me remind you, that's serve Yahweh. Yahweh. So, now therefore, fear Yahweh and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve Yahweh. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve Yahweh, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, that would have been, by the way, in Abraham's day, or the Chaldees, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living, that is, the Canaanites, and he already mentioned the gods of Egypt. So these are all those competing little g gods that, uh, that are around them. He says, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. We, are, we have made our decision. We are going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve Yahweh God. And so that's, that's his final call to, um, to the people. They're faced with other gods. Joshua makes his choice, and he calls others to make that choice with him. In fact, in verse 16, the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. For Yahweh our God is he who brought us up and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whom midst we passed. Yahweh drove us out from before all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve Yahweh for he is our God. God. 
and that's the call of the people. In fact, just to give you a precursor for next week, in the book of Judges, it says, Now there arose a generation who did not serve Yahweh. This is why it is so desperately important for God's people to teach their children and the next generation to follow the Lord. Because we are always just one generation away from idolatry, one generation away from coldness, one generation away from wandering away. And, and it's up to us to teach that next generation. Some of you may be wondering why I make such a big deal about things like RAs and GAs, about kingdom kids, about having a children's minister who can, who can invest in the lives of our kids and their families. It's because of this very truth. We must, while they're young, win them. Now, God is still God. He can still make allowances for the Rahabs. He can still walk in and, and rescue somebody in their advanced years. But that is not generally the way that he does it. Generally the way he does it is from generation to generation to generation as we make disciples of our kids and of our grandkids and those who follow after. That's why it's so important. That's why last night when we were sitting in here before we started and we heard the kids running up and down the hallway and excited and those kinds of things, that's why it was such, such a big deal. Uh, we, we have to teach them, um, teach them well. And so uh, that's the farewell address. It ends with God's, or Joshua's choice, and then it ends with the death of Joshua, uh, verse, verses 29 to 33. It came about after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim on the north of Mount Gaash. Uh, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who sur survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now they buried the, son the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had brought, bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in Gibeah of Phinehas, his son, which was given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, I believe that these last verses were written by Ephraim, I mean by Phinehas, uh, who was the, the grandson of of Aaron, the son of Eleazar, uh, who we have there in the end. That's how I, because obviously Joshua didn't write and Joshua died. So somebody else wrote that. I think it was Phineas there. Um, one great thing that I want you to see just in this closing, they buried Joseph's bones in the promised land. If you remember all the way back to when they were leaving e Egypt, uh, act, way, way before they were leaving Egypt, when Joseph uh, blessed the, his kids, he asked them, bring my, excuse me, bring my bones out. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that he made that request by faith, that he knew that the Lord was going to bring him out. Uh, the reason why I would bring this up now is, first, God fulfilled his promise. He promised J J uh, Joseph that there would be a day that they left, and Joseph believed so much so that he made, he made his people swear that they would take their bone, his bones out and bury him back in the Holy Land. What I want you to see is that even in the book of Joshua, even in the Old Testament, the foundations of by grace through faith is there. Nobody has ever been saved by their good works. They've only ever been right with God based on their faith in him and the way that he has called them to be. And so that we see that at the very end of the book of Joshua. Joshua is buried, a faithful man. Joseph is buried, a faithful man. And one day, you and I, if we belong to the Lord, are going to see Joseph, and we're going to see Joshua, 
and we're going to see Phineas and Eleazar and Aaron and Miriam and Rahab all gathered around the throne, not because of anything good in them, but because of their faith in the Lord. The same reason why you and I are going to be there, because of our faith in the Lord. That's our hope, and that's our promise. So, I love the book of Joshua. I sped through it. I didn't tell you about Balaam. Uh, I should have, probably. Balaam is killed in the battles as they're dividing up the land. This false prophet that we talked about in the book of Numbers is finally killed in the book of Joshua. And so he meets his demise. Lots of, lots of cleaning up happens in the book of Joshua, and then they're finished. So what are your questions? Any questions yet? Everybody good? Everybody like the book of Joshua? I do. Judges is not nearly as fun as Joshua. I promise. I'm just telling you that. We, we're going to be in for it starting next week. Remember two weeks, uh, Young Hearts and not, uh, and not Old Testament Survey, and then we'll meet again as the Lord allows the next week. Uh, let me pray a blessing, and then y'all can go. Lord, bless my friends. Uh, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God who led Joshua, and the God who raised Jesus from the dead be our God too. May we be firmly entrenched in our faith May our lives demonstrate it, and may we, like the spies, walk and live by faith. Lord, we love you and thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a great day.